Rachel. Hi, you guys. This is Ginger Cook, and we're at story time. And uh, we decided to do this on a Saturday because we hadn't ever done one on a Saturday, I don't think, for a long time. And, um, this week got away from me a little bit. But today we're going to be talking about, um, I think the title is, that you know, Dee Dee, the dumpster, and hoarding. And But really the subject is really about the hoarders I've known and loved, um, you know, and we're going to talk talk all these experiences that have happened um, in my life regarding hoarders and people I've lived with that are hoarders. And then also I'm going to be painting a scene from um, our trip to Jamaica that will tell you a story about hoarders. And we might have a fun discussion about it later. It's just always fun to open up new topics, all right? So I'm on an 8 by 10 canvas. And um, I chose a red background because I happen to have one, and that is all the tutorial stuff you get from me today on that. All right. But when we talk about hoarders, I, you know, people often say, "Well, do you learn it from your parents? Do you learn these kind of things from your parents? I mean, do you learn? Do you become a hoarder from your parents?" And um, I was adopted at the age of five by a judge and his wife. As some of you may have heard these stories, right? And um, we just, um, my mother was a child. We, first we lived over in Bellevue, and they had remodeled a house for us to live in. And then we, um, then we later moved out to some ranch property uh, toward Kirkland. And, uh, and I think about it, I mean, we had like 10 acres. Five of it was woods that you really couldn't get into. But um, it's like practically swamp woods, and it was called Triple Creek Ranch because there were um, three little small creeks that, um, that ran through there. And one bet between the two houses. We had two houses separated by a garage. So I, I tell you this because um, uh, I'm thinking about um, we never had piles of anything anywhere on our property. Uh, there wasn't um, an extra pile, honestly. For, I can't think of a single thing that um, might have been piled anywhere. No, we just um, uh, we didn't do that. You know, my dad was not a. You know, my dad didn't do it. My mother didn't do it. We had a a cleaning uh, lady that came in once a week for the main house for my mother. All right, and then we had a. Um, and then we had a, my sister and I had a babysitter slash housekeeper, and um, she kind of cleaned up after the, us. But my, my mother made a huge deal about cleaning our rooms and 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 not leaving stuff around. My sister was pre sister was pretty good about it. it. Was interesting. I'm trying to think later in life, she was better at it than me. Um, my sister Jeannie, she was a little better at it than me. I, I sort of struggled with that. I'll be the first to admit it. I did. I, I struggled with this idea of having anything so perfectly clean, all right? But uh, my sister certainly didn't, and she was, uh, and so, uh, we. and then, you know, I remember, I think you may have heard this in another story, but um, as a teenager, my mother was so obsessed with me keeping my room clean and so forth that <coughs> I remember her making the comment that there's not enough money in the world to pay people to pick up after you. You have to know how to do it yourself. So we all had to learn how to, you know, clean, you know, clean the bathtub after we got out of it. After every time you bathed, you cleaned the bathtub. You didn't wait till tomorrow. You did it right then. Um, I don't know if that encouraged hygiene or just um, not the lack of it, because oh, if I take a bath, I'll have to clean the bathtub kind of thing. But I don't think anybody really thought like that. But I'm just kind of kidding you guys. But there is that thought, right? And um, so my mom, um, you know, and then we had this sort of war going on when I was a teenager, and she was so adamant about me um, picking up, all right, that uh, she had instructed the housekeeper to throw my clothes out into the, you know, in, into the hallway and if they still weren't picked up to put it in the stream, I think you may have, that story's on another video about what happened with that, right? But I mean, that's how absolutely serious she was about this cleaning up. So she really cared about it. So she 
So that was, a, to me, that's sort of, a, you know, interesting in the sense that, um, uh, that we didn't get any, uh, there was no hoarding in, in, you know, in my life growing up. And, and this just didn't happen. They, they were not hoarders. If anything, they were the opposite of that. You know, they, they really didn't do any of that stuff. Where my um, first husband, Colby, because who I married at the age of 18, he was 27, um, he, he, um, I don't know if I would call him a hoarder, but he, not in the sense that, you know, or even, a, I, I don't think that would be the right terminology for him, all right? What his deal was, was that, like, for instance, like, I remember he was a project collector. There you go. He was a project collector. He collected things for projects. I'm going to do this someday, so I need all this stuff when I get around to doing it. Oh, gonna, I'm not going to do it tomorrow or maybe next month, but when I get around to doing whatever it was, I have to have the stuff. One of his ideas was, um, was to put a solar system. We lived in this condominium, three-bedroom condominium. Um, in Aspen, Colorado, and it was a basement, and then the living room was very small, kind of shoeboxy shape, but just all, like three shoeboxes stacked on top of each other. And then the top floor was two bedrooms and a bathroom, little bathroom, nothing glamorous or big or anything. And the downstairs was a living room shoebox shape, and then the tail end of it was a little square bedroom and another little shoebox, a little tiny square box bathroom very similar to the one upstairs and then I had a little tiny kitchen and then you went down the basement and there was a um, there was a, a complete basement with a washer and dryer which we had as an art studio because we were project people all right he was a project person I was a project person that's where I painted and that's where he did all his marvelous projects so he got it into his head that what he wanted to do is that solar was just coming out you guys that was just new uh, you're talking about 1966-67. Solar was um, absolutely an, a new thing. And he thought that he could build his own solar panel. And there was a... I don't think the magazine had come out yet about um, a, a Mother Earth or Nature. What was that magazine, John? Mother Earth News. Mother Earth News. I think he was a big fan of that. I don't remember if he saw it then. But he decided that and, and you have to understand that we didn't, he was not a drinker, okay? But um, his, um, he was not a drinker, but he, he, um, he did drink. Um, you know, he, he, he liked these little tiny um, Coors, um, Coors beers, little tiny ones, about, about that tall, little, little, little tiny cans of that. So he started collecting those. Now, because he was not a hoarder in, in the real true life sense of what a hoarder is, right? Um, he, um, he didn't have anywhere to collect the, the um, cans. And there was nowhere. He wasn't going to just put a big box in the living room or something like that. He wasn't, he wasn't that kind of hoarder, you know? That might have somebody said, well, I need this. I'm just going to pile them right here in the... You know, or I'm not going to pile them in a closet or something. We didn't have very much space in that condo. So I'm very grateful he didn't do any of that weird stuff. But he did want to collect them. So what he ended up doing was <laughs> in my closet, in the master bedroom, um, there was like a, um, I don't know if there was a door out to the eaves that went around the whole building, these eaves that were part of, I don't know, the kind of a little overhang. And there was a space in there, and that was, um, I really couldn't tell you what it was for, but it was part of the building. And, um, and I don't know if he cut a hole in the wall to access this or what, but we had a door there, and he threw all his uh, little um, cans in there, okay? You're going, what? Yeah, all the little cans. He had hundreds of them, and every time he threw them, you know, it went up there. For years, he collected these little with the idea that someday he was going to make a, um, he was going to have a, uh, for sure he was going to have a, uh, uh, he was going to have a, um, uh, you know, a, a solar thing somewhere on in, in our 
building on our part of the roof. I don't know how he thought he was going to get away with that with his association, even with only seven um, units in the whole thing. But anyhow, uh, that was his collection. But so I would say he was, and then but downstairs, you know, he's you know we had stuff, but we didn't have we didn't have piles of stuff. But then when we moved to um, uh, Southern California. We, we had four acres, and we built a house ourselves, and it wasn't very big. It was only, there was a living room, kitchen, bedroom, all in one room, and then there was a workshop between, and then Cinnamon was on the other wing with a, with a, with a bedroom, and, a, she, and she had a, a two-story bedroom with a loft and a ladder, and then a downstairs area. So, um, and then there was a little bit of space in the attic by her bedroom, but we didn't use it for anything, I think. Some stuff went in there, but really not, nothing. And um, so that that was um, that was Cinnamon's. Um, uh, that was in, just in Cinnamon's thing. But there was no no there was nowhere to um, to store stuff. Okay. So if you had a project, there was no, there was nothing like that. However, Colby figured out that um, we had four acres that we could store stuff, okay? And even though we didn't have a barn or anything like that, we never built a barn, the horses or anything. So behind our house, now we had what in California they call a house pad. And a house pad is um, just that. They have a hill and they just cut a flat area in the hill and you put your house on it and there's a hill behind you. So our house pad was very small for the four acres. There was no hardly any room. That was just you went out the back door and you took a couple steps and there was a hill, right? And then if you went out the, the you know Cinnamon's side of the house, you could go back out there behind her, and there was a little bit more of a space around the side of the hill where you could put maybe the space of say um, a one car garage space, maybe. Okay. So this is where uh, Colby kept his projects. And he was never sure, you know, you know, what kind of project he wanted to do next. But he had a lot of ideas, and he had that magazine that kept coming to the house, right? So, uh, what he did was he started. He would go. Um, there was things. Um, I don't know if I'd call it a dump, but there were these sort of junkyards that you could go to in California, these, these wonderful junkyards. And then he would, um, uh, he would, you know, go to this junkyard and he'd go around looking for things that people didn't want anymore that he might be able to use if he could figure out what to do with it. And since he didn't have anything particular in mind when he got the stuff, okay, he threw it all in a giant pile behind the house behind Cinnamon's. Now we had four acres. Could have maybe found a, a, a um, you know, somewhere else to put it. You know, just saying, right? We had four acres. Could have found somewhere else to put it, but he didn't. All this stuff, and then it, um, for instance, when we got all that pipe, you know, to, you know, that was all put there until we figured out where to put it. And, um, And, and you couldn't see it when you drove up the driveway, and most people didn't go in the backyard. So in some sense, you know, I, 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 I don't think he understood what my objections were to it. I couldn't stand that pile. It just made me crazy. I couldn't understand. We had four acres and all this junk. Um, it was so deep that, you know, animals were living in it, and, you know. It could be snakes. I don't know what was in that pile, but I didn't like the idea of the pile, and I didn't like any of it, right? So anyway, but we, we didn't really argue about it, but we, but I definitely, I was not a fan. Does that make sense? I was not a fan. And, and, he, and it just kept getting bigger because he had these projects in mind that he, he wanted to do, which required, um, apparently, uh, this... I don't know what to tell you about about it except it was <laughs> well, 
what can we say about it, John? It's just that it was, it was a, a maybe, maybe, maybe do something pile. That's it's interesting. It's one of those someday piles. It's a someday pile. That's what it was. Someday pile. It's a someday pile. That's what it was. Someday pile. And and it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and uh. Wow, huh? Just, <laughs> you're going, oh, Ginger, I'm so sorry. That sounds terrible. And then, yes, it was. Terrible. Terrible. So, anyway. Um, that was his, um, let's see, get some zinc light out. That was kind of his thing. But, again, we didn't have anything in the house. The house was not cluttered with anything, particularly. We didn't have, we had some bean bags. We had some stuff, but. But there was not was not cluttered. In fact, I didn't, you know, that, well, I didn't even have a kitchen cabinets. I just had a kind of a cupboard. He never finished the kitchen. But um, so, you know, to be f f in fairness to him, um, you know, he would have never considered himself a hoarder. We didn't have. Um, but I mean, you know, then then you go. He, I think he would have, if if I had said, well, you know, he was a hoarder, he wouldn't have thought so, right? But he certainly had this giant, ever-growing junk pile, that I think, as long as we had lived in that house, would have kept getting bigger. So, anyhow, when I married George, when I first met George, and we started dating, the first clue that he was a hoarder. Um, was there. I just never heard of hoarders. I didn't know there was such a thing as hoarders. There weren't any TV shows about hoarders, right? So I really didn't think such a thing existed. I mean, I, I know that's naive, but I, I, I really didn't think that there was such a thing. Does that make sense? I mean, really? Um, no, I didn't think so. So, I just really have to rinse my brush now. Uh, the first inkling that he might have been a hoarder was when he, when I first met him, we were working um, selling cars at uh, Carl's Man Mitsubishi. And um, I remember we were doing an art, we were doing a, um, a, um, a car show, and he had to go to his apartment to um, to change. And that's where the first time I saw this apartment, it was crammed. Everything around his bed was stuff. And his explanation was that he just in this one bedroom apartment, he had rented out the other room to a friend to help pay for the apartment. And uh, even though he was the leaseholder, and he. Um, he didn't have anywhere to put all this stuff, but normally he didn't live like that. But this was only there because of that. And this seemed like, a, you know, I don't know, maybe it's an explanation. I, you guys <laughs> laugh about all the explanations I believe people. I, I have a tendency to believe people. I never assume anybody's lying to me. But maybe in his mind that was true, you know, too. He's very congruent when he said it, okay? So, um, uh, anyhow. Uh, I'm enjoying painting this and telling you about that. So when we we got uh, married, we hadn't been married very long. The first thing he saw was he moved out to the ranch. Colby moved out and George moved in out to triple, to our ranch property. And the first thing he disparaged was this pile project pile of, of Colby's. Oh, my. He didn't want to hurt my feelings, but he couldn't believe that anybody would just pile junk like that about that. And that was just terrible, which is really funny. This is like the pot call, calling the kettle black here. But, you know, he, oh, no, this is terrible. And can you believe it? Poor Ginger, she had to live like this with this, you know, this junk pile, right? <laughs> just. So then he, he, um. Uh, he proceeded to get most of that taken to the dump because we were selling the property. 
And he had it all taken to the dump. He managed to get rid of most of it, which was good. It had to go, right? And muttering and mumbling, why would anybody want this? And well, see, Colby's kept all this stuff. Not for, it wouldn't make any sense to anybody that wasn't planning on building who knows what in his mind. Every, everything he brought home was a future project for something, right? He truly expected something magnificent to occur from this stuff, right? So, anyhow, we, we, so we, and then we moved to Texas. You know, we sold the property in California, we moved to Texas. And, the, you, know, you, you know, hoarding doesn't happen overnight. It just doesn't. It, it, it's an acquired skill. Well, I mean, you have to acquire the stuff. You don't just go home with a big pile. I'm going to keep all this stuff. I didn't bring home a big, you know, dump truck full of stuff and say, I've missed my stuff. I just, this is some miscellaneous random stuff. I'm keeping it all, right? But, um, but there is, um, there definitely is a, um, a pattern to snow. And, and of course, we, we moved out to California. We didn't have much. So um, uh, what was interesting was the stuff he kept. We didn't, we moved out to Texas here from California. And in his, when we finally moved into our big house with this, with, um, um, with six bedrooms, two story, three car garage, uh, he had his own closet. And one of the things he had in his closet was he had kept was his, the uniform he wore when he was in the military, when he was in his 20s, when he was 135 pounds and shaped less like an Easter egg. <laughs> I'm sorry, this spoon is a bad He used to wear these Hawaiian shirts and he you know, this, just like a decorated Easter egg with these little legs and, oh, sorry. Um, that just sounds like a bitter divorcee person, right? But no, no. You think I lie about this? I know. So anyway, um, well, it's still too wet. So his, um, you know, and his claim to fame, right, was um, uh, You know, he had, he had, he had, he kept the most weird stuff from his, you know, memorabilia you know, from his childhood. He, he took, he had some paintings that he had done that went up in my closet, art room closet. He had paintings? Yeah, he painted once when he was younger, though he never painted, you know, when he was married to me. And, um, yeah, I mean, he definitely had painted something. And, um. And I'm trying to think some of the stuff that he collected from. Oh, he had these speakers from that he bought in the, when he was in the Germany in the military. He was over there in Germany, stationed over there, and he had these uh, speakers. He'd paid a lot of money for. Now they they make other speakers now that are probably much better than what he bought like 30 years before, but um, you, you know you'd think that. You know, they were part of the king's treasure trove. These speakers were so marvelous. And they were just big, clunky things, huge, ugly things, upholstered, but, you know, really terrible looking things. So, anyhow, um, he, um, he had those and then some other stuff. And, but most of the time, you know, our, bus our business kept us very busy. All right. And, I mean, you know, we had the rental properties and, and stuff like that. So he was very busy. But when we sold all that, um, we sold the rental properties. And then we, um, he had time to think about doing something else with the, with the income from the rental properties. So, um, you know, for the sale of the rental properties. And so he decided that. What he wanted to do, well, first off, let me back it up a little bit. When we first moved to Texas, Texas was in terrible shape. And um, 
there was a um, a lot of bank foreclosures and uh, houses and also banks had gone out of business and so we started going to auctions and um, and that's how we furnished um, a lot of our our our, uh, our house and stuff and the things that we um, that we had you know our office and everything from the auctions all right um, so that's um, you know I don't want you to think that that was all that unusual but no that's what we um, that's what we did so uh, we had been to auctions before but there were always auctions in Texas and he started going to auctions and thinking, well, I could resell this on eBay. There was such a thing called eBay. It just started. He wanted to be, he wanted to sell something on eBay. He thought, thought that sounded like great fun. He thought he could be an eBay person. And so he started bringing stuff home on eBay, and some of it went in a junk room upstairs. Okay. And then some of it, that was too big to go upstairs went in the backyard behind beside the house and this was this was over remember we were married like 24 years 24 years and I had a it um, I mean we were we were married a while right so it didn't take long for for this stuff to to kind of it started to pile up it just kept piling up and then he had this thing about throwing anything away. My watch isn't even on, John. Have I been painting for about an hour? Should I stand up for a minute? My dear, you've only been in it 30 minutes. Okay. Relax. <laughs> I got to dry this. John's going to read you a little bit about what we looked up about the difference. Well, between... now, if you dry that, I can't do that. Well, I have to dry it, so just well, sorry. you go you ahead guys. and dry that. Everybody muffle, muffle your ears, and then I'll come back. And I have something important to say. Okay, now, since we're talking on the topic of hoarders and people that collect things and never throw things out, I have a little something here that we came up with to explain these different characteristics or personalities as they may be known. We have what's called the collector, the hoarder, and the person who never throws stuff out. Now, let's imagine you have three friends who all like to keep things, but they each do it differently. Let's see how they compare, shall we? This way, maybe you can fit into one of these slots, or your friends will. The collector. This friend loves to gather specific items, like comic books, stamps, or maybe even acrylic painting sets. They're super organized and display their collection proudly. It's like having a treasure chest where every piece tells a story. They know exactly what they have and, and often talk about the value or the history of their collection. That's the collector. Are you a collector? The hoarder. This friend keeps a lot of stuff too, but it's different from collecting. They might feel worried or stressed about throwing things away, even if those things aren't useful or valuable. Their stuff can pile up so much that it makes living in their space hard. Like finding a place to sit or walk can be a challenge. It's more than the fear of letting go than the joy of the items themselves. Are you a hoarder? Hmm. Now we have the person who never throws stuff out. This friend doesn't necessarily collect specific items for a theme, with a theme or emotional attachment. They might just get around to cleaning up or deciding what to keep and what to toss. Their stuff isn't organized in a special way and it might not take over their living space like a hoarder's would. But they still have more things than they actually use or need. Hmm. I think a lot of us fall in that group. Yep. So, in a nutshell, a collector has a passion and a pride for specific items. A hoarder struggles with anxiety about parting with possessions. And someone who never throws stuff out might just not pri prioritize decluttering or might keep things just in case they may need it later. Now that is your lesson for the day on collector hoarding and throwing things out.
Well, you know, I think that's good. I mean, we looked that up because I thought that was interesting. I mean, because there's a lot of name calling going on here with hoarding, hey, hey, right? Hey, no name calling. No, we're not name there's calling because that's, that's just that's just not who we are. But it was interesting because I know, that, for instance, that um, accumulate things, and I could certainly, every once in a while, you have to give it the old heave ho, right? When in doubt, throw it out, kind of thing, right? And um, and, and sometimes I'll go into some sort of manic phase where I'll just start dumping stuff like crazy, you know, just... And then a week to... later she goes, oh, where did I put that? Oh, I threw it out. That's right. Well, not really. I know I threw it out, right? But, but there is this other aspect of, you know, some of that, that hoards. And... Um, uh, you know, in, in our house, for instance, Georgia's stuff was, we had an attic and all kinds of stuff. For instance, he wouldn't throw out any cardboard boxes because we might need them for moving. So we had an attic full of boxes for TVs that we no longer had for all kinds of stuff. And then he liked to hoard kitchen items. And one of the things that if you guys remember... Teflon, the Teflon people that made Teflon pans, whoever did that, when they first came out with that, they knew at the time they released those uh, pans for people that if they, if they got overheated, they absolutely knew this, if they got overheated, they would, um, they would uh, cause smoke in the kitchen and make you sick. Absolutely knew that. And then once, once, it, once, you'd, um, once you'd had them burned, that you really shouldn't use them, right? Um, and that came out finally, but you know when, when we had an old burned pan, it just went back into the kitchen somewhere. It never got thrown out, right? I know you're going. What do you mean it never got thrown out? Just that never got thrown out. So um, we had. Um, uh, when when George and I got divorced, uh, one of the things that we did is we took some uh, post-it notes, uh, different colors. He had the blue ones, I had the pink ones, and then there were some green ones. And you put post-it notes on anything you thought you should you wanted. It didn't matter if you wanted it. Didn't matter if they want the other person wanted it too. You put the post-it notes on it, and then the idea behind that was that. Um, uh, and then there, there was stuff that nobody wanted, okay? Nobody cared about. You could have it. I don't want it, right? Kind of thing. So we had that, all right? And then we had... Uh, um, so, you know, we had... So when John and I went to have the kitchen redone, all the cabinets repainted uh, after the divorce, and... Um, uh, and all that. When we went, we went to do that. Where the um, the the painters took everything out of the kitchen, and and it, all back in the cupboards because they painted inside the cupboards too. They took everything out. And uh, the um, there was this pile in the living room, and we went to put stuff back. We got out. We threw out three garbage bags full of yeah just warming up the, just three out the garbage bags just for the stuff that he left in the kitchen now you're saying well he left it what, what you, didn't you think you left it too now you got to understand what what happened here it, it became a joke cinnamon cinnamon um, and I would see a pan that we knew had to go all right and we, um, and I would throw it out. George would go through the trash <laughs> and take things back out of the trash that we had thrown out that he felt we should keep. You can't throw this out. You can't throw this out. What are you throw? This is good stuff. Why are you throwing this out, right? So the only way to throw anything out was maybe to put some dog shit on it or something so that nobody wanted to touch it. Or wait till he was out of town to throw such just to start you know to start throwing things out because you couldn't you couldn't have the conversation and you couldn't have the 
you just, there, was just, there was just no conversation that you could have about this. Make sense? So probably not to you, and you're going, really? So he, besides the eBay adventure that never, he never managed to, he, for instance, he, he would go to a, an auction and buy typewriter ribbon and then sell it to people in third world countries that couldn't buy it anymore. But I mean, how often can you do that, right? And then how many people want that? So how many people didn't want typewriter ribbon because everybody doesn't use a typewriter anymore? And, he, he, and he, he'd show people his, his eBay room and he'd say, look, I've got, he'd, be, he'd brag about it just like the treasure hunter guy, right? I, um, I got this on eBay and I, I got this um, uh, for, for 50 cents and I'm going to sell it for $5. And he never figured out what his time was worth on any of this, right? That never came into play. Okay, just didn't. Um, and you're going, oh my God, Ginger. And I'm going, I know, I know. So, <laughs> so. Money had no value to him. I mean, yeah, time, yeah, time yeah. had no value. Time had no value, right? At the time didn't. And, and he didn't understand. And then, um, and then when he, un unlike, unlike Colby, who when Cinnamon's dad, when he would go to the um, to the junkyards and stuff and buy weird stuff, he actually had something in mind he might do with it. He maybe never did it, but he thought he had something in mind. It was it was for a different project, but for sure he might do it, right? Where um, George, on the other hand thought it looked interesting and maybe you could do something with it. He wasn't sure what, but why not have it just in case you ever realized what you could do with it? More of that kind of thinking, right? You're going, surely not, Ginger. And I'm going, oh yeah, you friend, dear friends, let me tell you, that's exactly how it was, right? So, um, anyhow, uh, so he had this, and then he had he had this, you know, as, it, as time progressed, he had a, um, a bird business. He sold bird perches. And how that happened is another story, but he, he ended up selling these bird perches that he made. And then he, when he would go around to the different um, pet shops to uh, uh, sell his wares of the bird perches, um, he realized that there was a lot of money to be made in bird toys. He could see that. They couldn't believe it. Some little piece of, you know, five five cent worth of junk, and you had a bird toy, and they chew it up, and then they need another one, and uh, because birds are very smart, parrots are very smart, and pe they're kept in captivity, and they have the IQ of a you know four year old kid. So people have to keep them. It's sort of entertained, right? And so uh, he happily. Um, went around, he decided that he could make bird toys too, but he, you would need a bunch of stuff for that, you know, you would need like hundreds of, of the wide tongue depressors and maybe some ping pong balls. And so he started collecting those things too, whenever he ran across something that might make a dollar store or something that would, might make a good bird toy. And then finally he decided the dollar stores weren't enough. He had to go to the wholesale dollar store. He actually had a wholesale account at a dollar store, big warehouse thing for all the other dollar stores, so he could start collecting stuff for his um, for his bird toys. <laughs> I hadn't made any yet, okay. And then he realized that he needed some bicycle spokes, and, and then then you couldn't have just plain wood. You had to dye it, and it had to be you know okay. So then he had you know, food coloring, and he had an operation going here with the, um, <sighs> it's just hard to even tell you this stuff, right, of going with the, with all this stuff of this, of these imaginary things he was going to, you know, make these bird toys, and so that was up in the junk room on shelves, and then, um, besides extra boxes, and then that kind of stuff, and then, then we had a three-car garage, which we never ever used as a garage, because we had stuff in there, too. Um, back from when we had rental properties and stuff, he would, he would store, um, you know, like stuff we needed for those and then miscellaneous stuff in the garage. And, 
At one time, when he was younger, when he was in his 30s, he rode bicycles. Now, the whole time I met him, he only rode a bicycle once that I remember, but he had these bicycles hanging upside down in the garage that he might ride someday. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> bicycles. yeah, yeah I, got the, I got the story on those. Yeah, the bicycles. And this is when I was doing them, and I did this, and I did that, and I, you know, in the garage, too, from... Um, where we, when we bought the house, he got a deal with the, some auction on some molding, crown molding and stuff that he might put in the house if he ever got around to it or somewhere that was just up there too, when that wasn't being used. And there was all this stuff that wasn't being used but might be used someday, maybe, right? All right. And then... Uh, he, he really imagined he wanted to do all these things. Um, he had this great, he had great hope to do all these things. So he decided, so at one point he had a, uh, um, let's see, where am I going with this? I'm just trying to remember so I can tell you. So he had a, um, uh, Oh, so he had the, so he had, he had the, the, the garage full of stuff, and then he had the attic full of stuff, and then we had a, an office over the garage that was full of stuff, and um, we had all these desks and computers and stuff like that, and there was one point where I really wanted to clean, I wanted the office really for, a, for an art studio, but I had, a, I had just one of the bedrooms even when we didn't need the office anymore. But at one point I remember um, bringing in a person that, that could organize the office back when we were using it. And uh, she looked around, she was very, George wouldn't get out of bed, he thought he was gonna criticize her. He was gonna, she was gonna criticize him. He didn't wanna get out of bed, wouldn't, you know, and I, I paid her to come. And she's, she's looking at the, um, what we've got here, and she's going, well, who uses that desk? Um, well, that used to be my brother's when he was here, but nobody uses that anymore. And then she'd go around, and she's okay, and she says, what is, um, what's that telephone cord just on a nail, just hanging loosely? See, remember how you have cords, you'd plug them into your, old phone, your phones, back when you had phones, not cell phones, remember those? Oh yeah, the, yeah, we had one of those, that. you know, wire cords. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, wire thing. It kind of curled around and kind of curled up on itself. Remember that? So she goes, um, "What's that?" And I'm going, "What's what?" She says, um, "That cord up there." I said, "What cord?" She's the one that's hanging on the wall. I said, "Huh? I never noticed that. I don't know." just hanging there in case we ever need a cord, I guess. And then she looks at the, um, at the next thing and she goes, what's that um, computer on the desk there? Um, who uses that? I said, uh, nobody. It doesn't work. Well, but it might someday. But why is it still there? I said, well, it might work someday. Somebody might fix it, you know, because that was the, the party line there at the house, right? No, no, this is good stuff. You can't throw that out. This, this is good stuff. You can't throw that out. Somebody might fix it. You don't know. Sure, don't know. That's right. Don't know. Somebody might fix it, right? You never know. You don't know. Gosh darn it, you don't know. You don't can't take the risk. Somebody might fix it. So then it kind of went on like that. Does it make sort of sense? She'd go around the house and ask about things. And, um, uh, and I'd say things like, I don't know. And then she wrote, she had me write down something. She said, do you know what uh, visual noise is? And I'm going, no. She says, well, that's what you've got here in this room. Just tons of visual noise. You've got all kinds of stuff. No, that serves no practical value. Like, for instance, she said, why is your copier 
so far away from all your stuff. I said, because that had the big outlet, right? Because it was clear across the room because it had a big outlet. Seems reasonable, right? And, you know, rather than say just get another outlet for it, right? I know. You're going, oh, Ginger, surely not. This didn't happen to you. It did. So. Oh, the pain and suffering of it so all. So I wrote down the word visual noise because she says the reason you can't stand to be in this room is because you've got too much clutter. And it's screaming at you only at stuff. You know, I'm telling the story on myself and George because... I, I can't be the only one out there that had to live with somebody that's a hoarder, right? Because it's it's devastating. And uh, so um, you know, as we were going on with it, you know, this, you know, did anything ever get cleaned up in the office when she came? I'm going, well, no. Nothing actually did. But um, but I had a sense, because you couldn't. You could no more clean that office up than you could clean out a, a bad pan in the kitchen. All right? It just could, you just couldn't do it. You just couldn't do it. Because you'd hear about it. Now, and sometimes you've got to understand, are, are you willing to have the argument, how bad is it? And are you willing to have the argument, how bad is it, before you're going to have an argument about it? Right? That's, I think, what a lot of people ask themselves is, um, does it really matter? Has it, you know, how bad is it? And sometimes it's a little bit like, you know, there's a story... Of you put a frog in boiling water and he jumps right out, but if you put it in slowly, if you uh, put the water in, in cold and then gradually turn up the heat, he just gets cooked. And I think a lot of people get hooked by the hoarder, cooked by the hoarder they're li living with. I think that's a fair. Yeah, I think so. Th you get you get literally cooked by that person, in the sense that you just. It, it can, can show maybe when you're first married to them, you've got a little leeway through, um, you know, maybe making love or something like that. But, um, you know, at some point, you know, you've sort of lost, you have lost the battle. Yes and yes? You have lost the battle. And uh, so uh, I know this is going to raise some topics. So you just, you know, you try to make a space for yourself and, you know, this is untouchable. No one screws with this space or you all die and kind of stuff. And, and I remember that and as he was going on collecting things and piling them in the backyard, we had a pile. We had a dumpster pile of, you know, big metal pieces of this and that and God knows what. And... Um, it was a lot of God knows what stuff, right? And um, in our um, in our backyard behind the house, she and then it started to creep out from away from the behind the house. It started to creep up toward the pool. Yeah, you're going no, and I said yeah. So suddenly you could see it from the you could see part, parts of this from the kitchen. And I remember Cinnamon saying to George, she says, you know, Mom is really upset about this. Upset about what, he says. What's your mother upset about? Your mother's not upset about anything. Your mother's fine. Just ask. She's fine. She says, she's upset, Cinnamon says very patiently. She is totally upset about all that stuff that you've got in the backyard that you've just piled up there. And then George looks at her totally dumbfounded that anybody would be upset about any of this wonderful stuff. Yeah, because, you know, why would you? Really, really, why would you? Yeah. And he's going, he says to her, this is not my fault, he says. And then, 
Cinnamon, who's a real wise ass and makes me laugh all the time. I love Cinnamon. She is so funny. If you haven't noticed how funny my daughter is, she gets on a roll. She's like one of the funniest people I know. And she says to George, she says, well, what do you mean? It's not your fault. She says, what's happening? Are people throwing stuff over the, yard, over the fence in the middle of the night? Is that how all that stuff got there? Come on, you guys, that's hilarious, right? <laughs> and then George says, shut up, Cinnamon. <laughs> that's not funny. Of course, it was hilarious. I thought it was hilarious. I was kind of listening to this going, I thought it was hilarious. Cinnamon's very brave. She was willing to confront the, 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 the evil hoarder, right? <laughs> Just, this is not my fault. But then he decided that what he needed, because he really was running out of it. So then what I did when he was out of town was I had a fence company come come out, and I built a fence just enough to the side of the house so I didn't have to see his stuff anymore. I kind of put it behind a fence screen. It was still there, okay? But I didn't have to see it. I know, it's sort of chicken, isn't it? But that's what I did. And uh, so, um, uh, but you know, that did. So then eventually, he found a warehouse, a hoarder's dream. He had a warehouse about half the high size of a Home Depot, really, um, and over at Hooks Airport, about half that size. And um, uh, <sighs> I know. Um, so he found this warehouse, and um, and he rented it. And he decided what he was going to do, because he had bought some sort of plastic machine things, and he was going to make, what he decided he wanted to do was he was going to make planks uh, out of plastic. He'd found a bunch of plastic um, pellets on sale at some warehousing thing and some sale and he had collected all this stuff and he thought he would, he hired a guy and um, you know that sort of a, a retired person that couldn't work anymore because they were an alcoholic and too out of their mind most of the time to be sober but but they were they were cheap, okay, and um, they could be had for little money. And and he got this big warehouse, not very far away from the house, about a half an hour, thirty minutes from the house. And he started collecting more stuff. And he decided what he was going to do was he was going to make these wooden planks. Now, he had no, no experience in plastic, didn't know the first thing about it, uh, learning as he went, asked some questions. We had a friend that actually had a degree in that, and he was going to make stuff in these things. And the problem was that he was getting warped stuff, and he wasn't, he wa wasn't working, you guys. <laughs> wasn't working, okay? So... He ended up with a bunch of warp boards, and then you're going to laugh, but then his weird friend's kids were into something called s and I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that, but that's where people just beat each other up when they're having sex, I guess. And that's the kind of simple version of that. It's kind of hard to imagine, but I guess there's people that do that. And they thought they could take these... Um, these boards that they could take. <laughs> Sorry, it's so funny. <sighs> they could take the boards that didn't seem to work very well for um, um, uh, you know for horse trailers and, and backyards and patios because they couldn't make a straight one. They decided to do that, and then what they would do. It was they take these little boards and cut them up and cover them with fabric from the from the um, 
the sewing from you know you know from the fabric store, and they would make um, uh, paddles that you know they drill holes in them and everything, and you could they and they would sell them to people that were into that as some sort of toy, right? Paddles, spank paddles. I mean, I think they sold too. I mean, how do you market that? <laughs> just, just. And you're going, really? 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 Yeah. So that was, that, that as, the, as the saying goes, never got off the ground, right? You say that was the, but then, um, he ended up with a bunch of, he could make these long pieces of plastic. So he ended up with the, um, I have, maybe that's another story with the warehouse things, that what he ended up doing to actually start making a living with the plastic. But we'll talk about that another time with his warehouse. Uh, I'll just change brushes for a minute. And... Um, So, uh, and then his one of his. Then he had another idea somewhere that he could actually make some good a good living as an insurance adjuster. So he went to insure, He went to school, took some classes on that. That was after a big storm, and he found out how that they made a commission off all the damage, and that sounded pretty good. So um, he went to school for that, and then he had to be he had to be out of town. Because he, he had to go where the storms were. So now here, here's where the Dee Dee and the dumpster story come in. Okay, Then if there's more time, I'll tell you about the warehouse. But I wanted to be sure I told you Dee Dee and the dumpster story. So in, um, and in the meantime, uh, George's son has, um, um, has moved on. And um, they're not, when he does this, he's, anyway, he's doing insurance. And he's um, closed out the warehouse. So, um, so my friend Dee Dee, um, I met um, in a coffee shop. She had opened a little coffee shop down the road from us, and we'd stopped in there, and just just down the road here in Cyprus, and it was wonderful. Um, Dee Dee's, um, Dee Dee was from Bulgaria, and she came to Houston uh, during, um, back in, uh, when, when communism was still in full, full, full go, and the Lakewood Church here in, in Texas uh, brought a lot of people, you know, everybody wants to give Ronald Reagan um, credit for, you know, the wall coming down, but there were lots of churches all over America that invited people from those you know, communist countries to spend a week or two and then they send them home, right? They were allowed to come and let them see how people in the West lived. And envy is a good thing, right? It just get a lot of people going, wow, this is nice. We we don't live like, these guys live a little better than we're living. Huh? This sounds pretty good, right? So um, anyway, Dee Dee, Dee Dee and her son, Dee Dee was... Um, an only child, still, still is an only child, she's an only child, and extremely bright, and worked under the communist, communist um, regime. And um, she, uh, when she came to, Tex to Texas on one of those exchange programs, she never went back, okay? And Dee Dee was the kind of person that knew, every you couldn't go anywhere in Houston, anywhere, where someone didn't say, Dee Dee, how are you? Everybody liked Dee Dee. And I still like Dee Dee. Everybody likes Dee Dee. I mean, she's just one of those people, you know, every once in a while you run, run across people in your lives that are just so amazingly fun, right? And like, everybody likes them. So, D Dee Dee um, uh, the coffee shop, she'd always wanted a coffee shop. And she'd been in America about 20 years, and um, her, her son had graduated from college, and she'd, her son had been 12 years old when he came, 
and, and he was now graduated from college and kind of on his own, right? And so she had her dream of this coffee shop, but, and it was, it was really, it was lovely, and she was such a good cook, okay? She was a marvelous cook. If you ate any, anything from her, she was a fabulous cook, and, uh, you know, really, I, I think chef really is, is the word for Dee Dee, because she was, I think, too, too good, too good a, 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 with cuisine to be considered a cook. She really was a, a, a fabulous, fabulous uh, cook. And so Dee Dee, uh, but she wasn't much of a businesswoman. And so she, the coffee shop um, really wasn't making any money. I mean, I'm sad to say it just wasn't. It just, it just wasn't profitable. And she kept it. She kept on it for a long time. And uh, George used to like to go to have coffee there with Scott. When Scott was living with me, I'd like to go have coffee and chat with Dee Dee. She chatted, everybody in the neighborhood loved her, and she, she chatted with everybody, okay? And uh, it, but it was expensive to go over there and have coffee with Dee Dee. <laughs> so I had made a deal with Dee Dee. I said, her, her bathroom was. Um, Pretty awful, the, the little coffee shop bathroom. And I said, you know, I'll do a mural in here for you if uh, 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 Scott and, and George never have to pay for coffee again. They'll pay for anything else, but they, 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 they're free, okay? And she said, sure. So anyway, I did this beautiful mural, all four walls in her, um, of Bulgaria in her coffee shop. I mean, it really was kind of neat. And um, and we got to be good friends. And I I sold some art, and I kept some, put some of my art up in her shop, and I sold some of that, and uh, and we got to be friends. Well, the coffee shop just couldn't sustain itself. Her son was helping himself to the till every other night. She never figured out where the money was, and she just she could barely make rent. She certainly wasn't making a living. And then stuff happened, and she had to you know, give her house back to the bank because um, she wasn't making it, she, she couldn't make the house payment and stuff like that, so and she was sleeping in the coffee shop and then there was this lady that one of her clients that uh, was wasn't had to go into, into for rehab for drinking and she said, and, and um, and she said to Dee Dee, she said, I would like it if you would come stay at my house and, um, and help me clean it up, because she was a bit of a hoarder too. And Dee Dee did, and actually fixed this lady's house up in the most extraordinary way. It was just wonderful, okay? And so when that job was over, Dee Dee didn't have anywhere to go, and Colby was out. Uh, or rather, George was off working, and I told Dee Dee, this is out of town, I said, just come to my house. You can stay there. I've got all these bedrooms. Nobody cares. Come stay at my house, right? So Dee Dee did. But, you know, Dee Dee was not a hoarder, and even though she liked George, she would always tease him. She liked him, because George was very, you've got to remember, he's very likable, isn't he, John? He's a very likable oh, very person. Likeable. You know? very likable and however Dee Dee didn't Dee, Dee Dee can't live in a mess that's not who she is right she was just not a person that could ever live in a mess so she said Ginger you've got to clean this stuff up I said I know Dee Dee I said I don't I just don't know where to begin I said just look at this attic there's rats living in the attic and and um we got to get rid of some stuff, but I just don't know where to begin. I mean, I mean, he, he just because more and more stuff, even afterwards, just he kept going to auctions and getting more stuff. Yeah. So 
She says, I'll help you. So her boyfriend, Craig, and her came over. Craig stayed there with her, with her Craig. And what we did, and, and since we didn't have the real estate company anymore, right? She said, you need this office as... Um, you need this as your art studio. I mean, it just has to be your art studio. And I said, Dee, I know. and even George agreed it should be my art studio, but at this point, it was so overwhelming, nobody knew where to begin, and there was all this stuff, and of course, if George was around to help, then nothing would ever go, because we had to keep this for gosh knows this reason or that reason, and so there was no, there's no way to clean anything up, right? So then, Dee, Dee says to me, she says, what we need to do is get a dumpster. And I said, dumpster? She said, I don't know how much time. So we looked it up on the internet, and for $500 for a week, I think maybe 10 days, we could get this dumpster that would fit in on one of the shelves, right under the second story of, you know, right under the window of our second, of, of our, off, our office, which was over the three-car garage. And she says, you can, we can get this dumpster And uh, we'll um, we'll fill it up and take it to the dump. So it was five hundred dollars. They came and um, Craig sat sat outside with the dumpster, you know, and. It was right under a win window, and we opened one of the big windows in, above the office and just started throwing stuff out into this dumpster. <laughs> You're going, really? Yeah, that's what we did, right, John? So we did, right? We went up to the attic, and we just cleaned out the attic, and we, we filled it up in three days, and we hadn't touched it. We hadn't touched the stuff, and we'd filled it up in three days. So, um, uh, we didn't touch the garage, and, um, but we, we had cleaned up quite a bit, and I felt pretty good about that, and we'd made a start on what I was going to have to have to do the, um, um, what I'm going to, what's going to have to have to do the, um, uh, to have this turn into an art studio, all right? So I, I, we had, I, I, we were that far, we were far enough along for that, yeah. So then, there's always a then, isn't there? So then, <laughs> um, uh, George came home, and. And you're waiting for the best, the big fight or something that happened. He never noticed that we had thrown anything out. He didn't notice that anything was missing. And you get rid of a whole dumpster full. Yeah, a whole dumpster full of stuff. And the garage was still full of stuff. He never noticed that we'd thrown out anything. I mean, you know, you guys, that's a little crazy, isn't it? Yes and yes. Yeah, never noticed. So I guess you don't know if you ever heard of Dee Dee and John never heard of this story, Dee Dee and the Dumpster, right? Dee Dee and the Dumpster. Well, and, it takes all kinds. And besides, you know, when George, you know, had to close the warehouse, he rented. Um, storage units. He, he rented uh, storage units. And he had seven, right? Seven or five? Well, he still has three now. He still has three. And um, when 
And then he had a pile of um, of those plastic bird perches uh, piled in the backyard. And there was still stuff in the backyard, even though he had put some stuff in the dumpster. Um, I mean, not the dumpster, in his warehouse. He still had stuff in his backyard. All right. There was a lot of stuff in that backyard. Yep. And um, just behind the house now, right? There's the fence and everything, okay? And Dee Dee had moved on to, she'd moved on to do other things. She, she was out in California with her son doing, playing handball and teaching stuff like that. And we still had, we still had stuff piled up when John and I, you know, bought the house, you know, George's, George out of the house. We had to, you know, we went ahead and did that. Uh, during COVID, we um, we did the we did the pool, and um, we we did the swimming pool and put it you know and the pool guys um, we paid them to clean up the what whatever was left uh, behind the house right. Yep, get rid of it. Whatever was there, their job was to to get rid of that, which they did. And they threw out, and there was so much stuff that there were snakes and rats living in that pile of stuff that was in the backyard. That was still there, that everything went to the dump. And if you ask, if you were to ask George if he ever thought of himself as a hoarder, he would absolutely say, no, absolutely he was not. He would not feel that he was a hoarder. And um, um, and you know this is I feel kind of bad. You know, I, I'm telling the story because I think that stuff creeps up on you. But you know, I think hoarders aren't born. I think they're made by life circumstances. That's my opinion on this. George grew up in a family that were very resource poor. They didn't have a lot of money. If his dad needed anything, his dad was a master sergeant in the military, sergeant major or something. He'd um, um, send the kids to the jump junkyard down the street from where they lived. It's like five kids in the family. And their job was to uh, find something, pick it up, and then they would, oh no, no, here's what he did. He would give, he would get stuff off the army base, his dad would, off the army base, and give it to these kids to go down to the junkyard and sell it. And they have money for the movies or something. All right, because his dad drank most of their money. He was a drinker and, um, Um, and that's that's what happened to their you know their stuff was that you know his dad drank the resources and, and both you know so you know you, you know when you're always you, just feeling like you just there's not enough you know I think that 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 could happen where you might just suddenly be very unwilling to get rid of anything for fear that you just you can't know when you might need it, right? So anyway, that's my, uh, when I talk about that. But I think that um, still, you know, there's, there's the, and there's extremes of that. And then there's just those of us that, you know, you, there's so many hours in a day and you should throw something out and you would, um, 
if you thought about it long enough, if you could. But, you, you know, then people don't. So I'm going to put my little person in here as I'm talking to you using my Posca pens. Okay. Any comments on this, John? Do we have anybody making any comments about our no. profound No, stories? people are saying they have relatives or people that they know are hoarders. and Nobody here is fast enough to be a hoarder, though. No, I'm sure not. No. Um, but, you know, one of my resolutions for this year is to just... Um, I've lived in this house since 19... Um, uh, 89 and I will probably go through um, we've already gotten rid of pile already you just get rid of more stuff you know just just left. just throw out more stuff that's just the rem that's reminiscent of um, You know what's what's here, right? I mean, because stuff like this, you know, honestly, stuff like this does have a tendency to pot. pot. Things can build up, yeah. And but I think that maybe living in a home that's neat. Um, is um, maybe the example of that when if kids always live in a neat environment will they you know, ask your question would they want to still be in a neat environment right and uh, is that something you know let's see if get a brown pen here I guess I have to shake that up too. But I think that artists, for instance, we have a tendency to maybe hoard art supplies. And I think not in the sense that, you, you know, you end up with thousands of brushes or, you know, because you don't throw it, you might be able to use it. There's always, I might keep this, I might be able to use it someday. And I think it's probably never a bad idea to consider just cleaning house once in a while we you know when you know it, you know a lot of times it's time don't you think John if you're a really pretty person you know you almost have to dedicate a day a week to just uh, you know maybe a day a month to just saying you know that I have trash here what can I what could I throw out right that kind of thing absolutely it's not dark enough that was the problem with these pens. Okay, we're going to have to suck it up and use a brush. Um, if I might turn around, I'm looking for something else. I'm having fun with this painting, I think. Oh, the, 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 I can tell you a little bit about the, 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 I finished a story about George and the toys. So he made these, he gave up on the, um, the paddles. Yay, right? And then he, um, uh, he decided he would, um, uh, uh, you know, sell those bird, make those bird toys. So he had these. He made some and he sold them, and he'd sit and watch TV at night, and he'd he'd he'd, he'd make bird toys. Sometimes I helped him. But you know, when he first started off, you know, he had he did all that, right? But then he didn't make any more. You know, he didn't. He didn't make any more bird toys. It just 
he had all the stuff and he kept buying stuff for bird toys and uh, that he might make and he never did. And I, I had said to him, you know, Dee Dee would make the bird toys for you. You know, she's just sitting here. Show her how to make the bird toys. Right? I mean, why not, right? She's there. She's there, right? Why not let her make some bird toys? He couldn't bring himself to let anybody else make them. Yeah? Why? I don't know. It's just, you know, he was hoarding those bird toys, too. And um, it, made, it made absolutely no sense to me at all. And uh, why he would do that. But he did. Yeah, well, it sounds like he, he needed to try to stay in control. Yeah, maybe. C control. He would feel like he was losing control. Yeah, I think so, John. I think that maybe that was it. it just Because he had, again, he had the opportunity to um, to, 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 you know, have the, you know, to have someone else uh, make them, and she, you know, and she put the, you know, profits for it, and it was, you know, and then when he, eventually his bird toys got uh, thrown out, and uh, to another story, he was so upset that these bird toys got thrown out. Somebody was out to get him by the throwing out his bird toys. Couldn't believe that anybody would throw these out, right? just so upset that anybody would throw out these wonderful bird toys and um, and it wasn't bird toys at all it was just boxes full of stuff that he'd that he'd kept in the garage and you know some stuff and the mice had gotten into them and chewed them and you know I mean there there wasn't anything he had this imaginary idea of what was there and that was the most interesting thing. He really imagined that he had stuff when he didn't. Make sense? Not to he me. Just, he, he imagined that there were things, you know, that there was a value when there wasn't, and that the, that, that frying pan was still good, or that the, um, that you could, um, Um, you, you could make, make use of something. He had this very peculiar idea about what was good and what wasn't. Um, and yet the bird toys were not a bad idea. I mean, you know, if you're just sitting there watching TV anyway, and you can make some, you use bicycle uh, spokes, you know, and hook things together. I mean, they're pretty easy to make and, and sell and, you know, the one thing about people with birds is that they have to keep buying them, right? So, it's, you know, you couldn't really, you, you can't argue that stuff, right? But yeah. still, nope. you know, you just, um, uh, yeah, right? Um, I don't know. These are funny. But he still has, John went one time with, with George to get some stuff out of storage. Remember that? Oh, yes. And, and it, was in, it was at night, and we needed something for something. I can't remember why we needed it. And um, uh, John went to get it. And um, that was George to get it. He, yeah, he went. Yeah, he went with George, right? And um, they went up to one of the warehouses, and they he didn't have the key didn't fit to the lock. He didn't know why, but it didn't fit. So then he he went ahead and got what? Did, well, you tell the story. You were there. Well, he tried to get his key in it, and, I, and it didn't work. And I go, Are you sure this is the right unit? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. This is mine. No, no doubt, no doubt. Been, you know, paying on it for years. 
So he cut the lock, opened it up, he goes, oh, this isn't mine. This wasn't even his storage unit. So, live and learn, and then we did find his unit finally, and we opened it up, and honestly, he's paying, what, two, 200 or something a month? Because this stuff, you know, it's going to make me a lot of money on eBay someday. And yeah, I that was in it. it. And there's nothing but rusted, I mean, things. And I just looked and shook my head. I go, you got maybe $5 worth of scrap metal in here. But. Well, I mean, that was the, that was the thing, John. You see, that was yeah. the thing. Um, uh He, um, he, ha he was absolutely, you know, you don't want to use the word delusional too freely, but absolutely delusional about what he had and, and, and why it was so hard to have a conversation with him because, and, um, because he absolutely totally believed that this stuff was worth something. Yeah? Oh, absolutely. It was going to be his next fortune. Yeah, right? And I got, um, it just, you have to kind of wonder, uh, because, you know, otherwise, you know, you talk to a, you know, really, honestly, perfectly not crazy person. But when it comes to stuff, they suddenly get, the craziness is just, it's there, right? Yeah. There's the craziness. And it comes to... And you wonder, how, how did that happen? Why, why, why did it happen? Where is it? Um, but then how did I end up living with it? Right? How did I get stuck? To, you know, so how did I get stuck with that? And, um, and, it, it, and how did I get out of it? It's like, like being the prisoner of Zenda and somebody else's stuff, right? Good ex explanation, yes? I think it's a great explanation. Of, of you know you know how did we how did any of us you know find find that so people don't realize that you see I've painted these little posts several times because you can't just paint stuff once you have to do layers people don't, don't anybody understands that you, I understand it Queen you got to do layers of stuff otherwise you This is a happy little beach house, isn't it? It really is. Um, and um, it's full of bright colors. And even now, I mean, like, like, um, like I say, he, George lives in California, and um, he still pays on a, a storage here in Texas, and three of them. And if you figure out, people that, you know, end up in these storage units, I often thought they should, should, you should just call them hoarders R us, because once they go in a storage unit, it's very unlikely people ever see them again, and they, they really count on people like, like George absolutely count on that because that's how they have their business, right? Their business model runs off of, off of that, yeah? Off of people that, um, you know, are going to just keep getting more stuff and, um, and, and, and the climate here in Houston, it's hot and unless you've got a um, you know, you're paying for an air-conditioned unit or something, you, you're going to find that a lot of stuff just gets gets ruined, right? Uh, 
um, I don't know. It's, uh, well, it's one of those things you got to decide. I mean, what's that stuff? It must have a value to you because you keep paying $200 a month on it. I'm not sure what the value is. Yeah, exactly, right? You know, somewhere you have to decide, okay, this is ridiculous. Probably my one of my goals this year is to just um, when in doubt throw it out, have it purge, and just the trash people come off, off it goes and uh, e even with the you know for instance like I will take a bunch of books to Goodwill because I don't need reference books anymore because I can get them off the internet so why do I need a whole library full of reference books anymore? Right? Exactly. Okay, let me just push the picture back a little bit and uh, let's see I want some of this color up here in the palm trees yeah, right now you can't go to Jamaica that well they're suggesting it's uh it's a level three category of warnings. Apparently the, the gangs were getting a little aggressive. Got good colors in there. Okay. They're very beachy colors. Yeah, this is kind of a... It's a good thing it's on the beach. Yeah, because it's on the beach, man. Well, it makes sense that it was called. And um, it's on the beach, and we're. So it's just a matter of putting in the contrast and stuff like that. My, my sister was a hoarder of shoes. Um, she just. She just couldn't stop buying shoes. Um, I, I don't know why. I mean, there's only, you know, at some point, there's only, so you know, where are you going to go? So many clothes you can wear, right? Where, where are you going to go, right, with this stuff? But she would, um, I say, she was a hoarder of shoes. I think I'm getting ready for the, uh, I'm almost ready for the. Not the frame. The frame, almost ready for the frame. I gotta just bring this down. Almost ready for the frame. Of our little project here. Person's kind of small, but that's all right. So I'm just going to give it another coat of
color here. Kind of this gray mauve color. Get a little bit more white and finish this up. Finish up the stuff. But I think it's just a such contrast, John, to how I grew up. Because um, I'm telling you what, that just never would have flown in our house. It probably wouldn't in yours either. Oh, Can you imagine not. growing up? No, I don't remember ever having anything laying around doing nothing. No, everything had a purpose. Yeah, or you didn't keep it, right? Yep. No, yeah, or you didn't even have it. Or you didn't have it, right? And even old toys were thrown out that you weren't playing with anymore, right? Yeah. They went somewhere. You didn't keep them forever. There were a few things that got kept, but mostly not. I mean, I mean, I still laugh about the the army clothes that he had in his closet that you know he could, could, hadn't been able to wear in thirty years, right? But he still had them, right? But any day he could slip back into them. Yeah, because you just don't know about these things, do you? No. And that's that to me is is so interesting too. I'm going to dry this one more time to get my final highlights, and then we right. can put it in a frame. Noise coming up, people. Pay attention. Put the final changes of colors and everything in here. Uh, so right back behind here. A lot of lighter. Probably, you know, move a lot can't be hoarders because they just can't keep taking it with them. People well, I knew a guy that he would, they would move every three years, period. And I go, why? He goes, we never collect anything that way. They would buy a new house every three years. I don't know how that worked out for him, but that's well, what they did as a family. Every three years they moved. Every three years they moved, huh? Yep. I hate moving. Um, but I guess if you don't have all your stuff, you wouldn't mind moving. Well, and then I had a, I had a friend that, um, she had a, um, a cleaning lady. And so she didn't want to have a lot of stuff for the cleaning lady to have to do. So she absolutely had no knickknacks in her house for that very reason, right? Which, I mean, it's interesting, you know, just didn't want to do that. Okay, let's do that. I want this to be lighter. Just really try darker, so you think you may have the picture, but then you don't. Almost have it, you guys, but no, no, fit, you know. But I just, I'm curious if when you leave in the comments, you know, you just, you know, this was sort of a, you know, probably more of a story of that I don't know if it affected people, um, you know. You think about um, what people, um, you know, go through just in their lives and then some small version of this. 
and you know it might be happening but I'm not using a stay wet palette because I want a thicker paint for something the other day so this is the one I'm using but Just keep playing with the lights and darks on this, as I like to do. All right, that's not the color I want. Let's try this one. Want well, a few little bright bits of color here. Let's try. This area in the front here in shadow as I'm painting this. Yeah, John and I did um, when we went to Jamaica. That one time we we went and did a Jamaica bobsled ride. Remember that? Oh yeah, that was fun. Right. That was fun, wasn't it? Yep. Um. And it was that what that was was you took this chairlift ride up to the top of um, of this big hill. It was all jungle, and um, uh, you um, when you rode it down uh, on these bobsleds, and they were two-person bobsleds and like a roller coaster, and you could get your own bobsled or you could. Um, uh, you know, ride with somebody else, and I wanted to see the scenery, so I said, "I'll just ride with you, John. You just, just make this thing go. I don't care. You, you do it. I wanna, I wanna ride. Um, I definitely want to be, um, uh, you know, on the, you know, just looking around. And it was lovely. It was all through the jungle. It was like, it was like going through a beautiful garden, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. That was so nice." was huh it was it just it was really nice and I I would have liked to have gone back and done it again then we went out then we did we had lunch in Jamaica too and it was John just loved the food and I think I could I could if I could start a you couldn't even touch clinic. the stuff the food was just I couldn't there was one seven course meal there wasn't one any of it oh, uh, every single could, course was good and I got double courses I, just, I absolutely <laughs> absolutely hated the food. I don't see how you can say that. I know, obviously you don't, but I, boy, I sure did. Just absolutely hated the food. All right, let's get up. Let's get us a. Um, a frame, maybe doll. All right, you can find one. And uh, I'll finish up anything else I need to do with the frame. Yeah, drying well, it out it's here. always in a frame. Huh? You have to dry it before I start. Yeah, I'll just give it a quick dry here. But this was fun. I could think. So, anyway, the dumpster, if you ever need a dumpster, um, they'll come and they come take it away. And. Um, and it's a very inexpensive way to um, alleviate your home from um, mm -hmm. alleviate your home from um, uh, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. That's a tough call on that. It's a tough call. Let's try this quick.
Okay, John will put that in the frame and we'll do my final touches on it. So again, this is a fun story time. These are not tutorials, they're just little, I, all these paintings have been pre-sold. And all I am just um, kind of sharing, you know, stuff that's happened in my life. Yeah, look at that one. Yep. Yeah, I do too, don't you? Yeah, good choice, good choice. And um, uh, let's see, I need a green pen, I think. Maybe this one. And that, and that's kind of, I mean, I think that's kind of, um, it's been fun to share some of this with you. We went out to to dinner last night with um, a good friend of mine, I've known for about 10 years, and and uh, and and uh, she's been kind of listening to the story times. And I used to tell her a lot of stories when I go over to her house because I used to give her art lessons. And um, and she's sitting there saying, "I I are you sure? I never heard that." You never told me that. That's, <laughs> oh my word! She goes, "That's so crazy." She goes, "Ginger, that's that's so crazy." And it is, isn't it? You know, all these things that happen. You know, maybe you probably have stories like that, and you just don't tell anybody. I'm just telling you. You know, I don't care. I'll tell you what's happening. You know. And uh, this kind of reminds me of our. I like painting. Stuff like this, John, it reminds me of our trip to Jamaica. That was a good one. And, um, So I thought that was, you know, I think that's, I think that's kind of, I think this has been fun. So thanks for, you know, for, for hanging in with us with our story time. I and believe another story time has come and gone. Yeah, another story time has come and gone. Remember, if you enjoy this type of painting or you're interested in expanding your art skills, um, the reason that um, our students, um, our art academy is, exists is to sh to show people how to paint, and um, we think we do a pretty good job of it, don't we, John? I think so. So uh, we would invite you to try us out, and uh, come hang out with us, paintingwithginger.com. Check out personal art coaching, see if that might be right for you. And share the videos with people. Leave the comments. Um, we think this is um, something that uh, anybody can enjoy, you know, art. We think it's a great therapy. And thanks for watching. Love you guys. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you on Monday show, live 530 Central Time, Monday for a full... Which is a tutorial. Which is a tutorial. Bye. Bye.